Welcome to Arts in the City. I'm Donna Hanover, and we're here at the Cloisters in Fort Tryon Park. This magnificent shrine to medieval European art and architecture was funded by John D. Rockefeller and completed in 1938, with three formal gardens that pay homage to the gardens of medieval Europe Tourists are attracted from all over the globe. We'll show you more of these spectacular gardens throughout our show. But first, he's a legend, an American icon. From his singing, to his acting, to living larger than life, Frank Sinatra endures even today. Pat Collins takes a closer look at his life and his work at a new exhibit at the New York Public Library. I've got the world on a string Sitting on a rainbow Got the string around my finger During a what career a that began in New York and New what Jersey and spanned six decades, Old Blue Eyes apparently saved everything. Las Vegas hotel room keys, his expired driver's license, backstage passes, whiskey glasses, sunglasses, and of course, a wall full of platinum and gold records. The exhibition is aptly titled, Frank Sinatra, an American Icon. Everyone I've talked to saying that we were going to be doing this exhibit would say, oh, I have a memory with my mom, or I have, I have been there, I have been to a concert. So in a, in a sense, everybody feels like they own him in a way, and so that's, that makes him the icon. At all times, he sang from within the song, uh, rather than just making a sound. He uh, became the song, so it became conversational, and that conversation was helped by his phrasing. These albums are novels, in a sense. Uh, he told his own personal stories through these novels. Fly with me, let's fly, let's fly away. A vintage jukebox contains 81 of his hits for Frank's fans to choose from. And in this recording booth, you can sing along with Frank. For another interactive experience, visitors can control Frank's audio on a mixing board. And a 1960 recording session for Nice and Easy captures Frank the Perfectionist. In another corner of the exhibit is this um, conversation that he's having while he's recording. So you get a real sense of being in the studio with him. What's the time on that? How long? 320? Wow. Oh, well. Wow. That's longer than the first act of Hamlet. Original posters from his early movies are among the Hollywood memorabilia here. A 1945 short film, The House I Live In, which promoted racial and religious tolerance, was one of Frank's favorites. The house I live in was very important to Frank and his legacy because it showed his humanitarian side where he uh, fought for human rights, basically, and he also won him a special Oscar. Frank won a competitive Oscar for From Here to Eternity. Items from his professional and personal life are juxtaposed in an enormous space on the library's first floor. Even the event's curators learned something new about Frank. I was absolutely surprised that he was a painter and to see some of the paintings that he made, he never sold them. They were all for friends and family and you can tell which ones were made for the grandkids. They even say, love grandpa on them. The 10 paintings on loan from the Sinatra family are publicly displayed for the first time. So too the items from Frank's closet, which include his Yankee jacket and blue pajamas. We also have his tux, which he performed in, and it really shows you how meticulous he was about his tailoring and his outfits. You're a nobody till somebody loves you. Frank will never be forgotten. Uh, and I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure of that. Geniuses don't go away. Sinatra will never go away. The exhibit is scheduled to close September 4th, and here's the good part. Admission is free. I'm Pat Collins for Arts in the City.
A surprise Broadway hit this season stars a member of a Christian puppet ministry whose sock puppet is possessed by the devil. Interesting? Lisa Beth Kovitz takes us behind the scenes. After a smashing run off Broadway, Hand to God hit the Broadway stage and hit it hard. With five Tony nominations, Hand to God's success is surprising for some of the things it doesn't have. No movie stars, no out-of-town tryout, no cinema tie-in. What it does have is a great ensemble, startling new story, and a possibly demonic sock puppet. When you envisioned yourself on Broadway, did you see the sock? Never in a million years did I envision a sock on my hand when I was on Broadway. I think I might have pictured like a David Mamet play. In a way, this is like Mamet with a sock puppet. It's like Glen Gary, Glen Ross with a sock puppet. This is Rob Askins. He's the writer of Hand to God. Rob, is an opening on Broadway everything you thought it would be? Like this is sort of the fairy tale version of how it's supposed to be to make a new play. Like you just try and you try and you try until at some point it all comes together and people get really excited about a show and then somebody else gets really excited and it sort of catches wildfire until like you end up almost as if on a magic effing carpet in these in this palace. It's like as opposed to some sort of like sugar rush or like pleasure high, it's like the sort of warm comfort that comes from doing good work and being rewarded for it. Like, that's the thrill here. So, yeah, it's everything you could imagine it might be. <laughs> when you talk to the artists behind Hand to God, they're all very clear about the collaborative nature of this production. As a writer, you sit alone and you make your pages and you write your dialogue and you figure out your basic structural issues and you have no idea what is going on. You know, you've got a hundred pages, you've got a hundred and ten pages, and it could be great or it could be terrible. But then you bring it to your friends, you bring it to the people who, who you know and who you worked with, and they help you take it to that next level. I heard that you made that first soft puppet. I did. Um, during the first reading, I, I read the script, and Tyrone, the puppet, is like half of what I need to do, and they weren't going to have a puppet, they were going to have an oven mitt. And I was like, I, we fight to the death at the end of this thing. I'm not going to do that with an oven mitt. So I went online, found out the easiest. I, I think I Googled easiest puppet to make. And sock puppet came up. So I bought a pair of socks. I made a sock puppet. I put some arms on it. And now that, that was the prototype of Tyrone. Hand to God's Tony nominations are in five critical categories. Best Play, Best Lead Actor, Best Lead Actress, Featured Actress, and Best Director. So what makes Hand to God so special? In New York, most, most of the time, it seems like you're a hired gun, you know? The play is written, they're, they're just looking for someone that checks all the boxes, and they, you're, you're not called upon to be a creative artist, you are called upon to merely be an interpretive artist and to, to take direction. And uh, this play was definitely, it, 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 it didn't work that way. This has been Lisa Beth Kovitz for Arts in the City. There's no problem, it's all in hand. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, really, what are you thinking? Are you putting the chilli in first? <laughs> no, it's, it's just, I, I, I usually, I fry the chilli so it infuses the oil. <laughs> Aha. Uh -huh. I see. I don't do that. I'm doing it the way I prefer. Yeah. 
Last year, we brought you a story about how restaurants in museums are revolutionizing the concept of museum dining. Magalie Laguerre Wilkinson continues her tour and visits three more restaurants that are serving art on a plate. Inside the Neu Gallery, a museum dedicated to German and Austrian fine art, is Café Sabarski, a restaurant specializing in Austrian desserts, snacks, and coffee. We gave New York something what uh, I believe didn't exist before. We gave her in New York a Viennese coffee house, a place where you hang out, meet friends, have coffee, have breakfast, have a little lunch dish. And I think we did this very, very well. I think it's, it's, it's a really a combination of putting you back to Vienna. In 2001, Chef Kurt Gutenbrunner launched Café Sabarski. Fed up with museums offering up the same choices for visitors, he developed a sophisticated menu of Austrian cakes, crumbles, tarts, and strudels. Even the coffee is imported straight from Vienna. I also think that with what we did here, we changed the way New York was, think, uh, was thinking about museum dining. Just think about it. We were the first museum restaurant who had a, a two-star New York Times rating. And it is good like this. It is good that, you know, there's good food when there's good art. People want to want to see this. Three blocks north of Cafe Sabarski, located inside the Guggenheim, is the Right, a James Beard winner for its striking design. The restaurant is helmed by executive chef Rodolfo Contreras, who literally moved up the restaurant ranks. Well, I started working as a boss boy uh, in New Jersey, and I made my way up to boss boy runner. Sometimes I answer the phone, I do the bartender, and pretty soon I'm a, I'm a waiter. I work at uh, many restaurants here in the city, uh, Mesogiorno, Coco Paso, Pino Lungo. Uh, so I made myself uh, up to become a waiter, but sooner or later I realized that my passion is for food. When I create something, I always have in mind that it has to have colors that they match together, uh, figures that they go together. So uh, just because of the place where I'm working right now, which is a museum, so we had to make things look a certain way so people feel like they are in a museum. How is this different for you? It's a different because um, not only you have to work with food, but you have to work and put together your menu and your ideas based on the exhibition that we uh, they, they have at the museum. So some of our uh, menu uh, items has to match uh, some of the art. Tying a menu to an exhibition is nothing new to the Morgan Library Dining Room's chef, Tim Buma. Most recently, the, there was an a exhibit of some works by Lincoln and how it tied into culinary. So they're, they're actually, we developed a, uh, um, a chicken fricassee dish that I think it was in one of his, his books that he had, or some notes that he had written about uh, food that he liked. And that um, translated to a dish that we created as a tie-in for, for this particular exhibit. Chef Buma has been at the Morgan since it opened in 2006. The dining room is simple but elegant, and even though it's majestic, there's still a homey feeling. After all, this was J.P. Morgan's dining room. Just the atmosphere here is, is fantastic, and it gives us the opportunity to be creative and do something that nobody else really does, because how many other museums and dining areas do you have in people's mansions. I definitely think of food as art. I think that uh, you, you know, most chefs think of it as a, a, a form of expression of themselves. So they, they take the raw ingredients, try to make it taste good, number one, but then they have the medium of their plate to be able to create something. And it's not just the plate, it's the whole atmosphere of the dining room. A lot of the chefs have, have the opportunity to create a visual impact or a sensory impact on, uh, at the table. I think it's a great opportunity to be artistic. And I think most of the chefs that I know, I think they have the, the successful ones all have a very strong artistic streak in them. I'm Magalie Laguerre Wilkinson for Arts in the City.
some artists concentrate on painting, some on sculpture, one artist in Brooklyn concentrates on growing her art. My focus as a design studio is to bring innovative materials and sciences, as well as new technologies, to design in a very sustainable way. Danielle Trophy created a vertical garden installation at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden that was so popular, it's been extended as a permanent exhibit. The vertical garden in her studio in Industry City is different in that it is hydroponic. It doesn't have soil. So everything is actually enclosed within the design. You have a water reservoir at the base and an air pump pumps the water to the top tier. The way it's designed is to use gravity to carry the water to all the subsequent uh, planters. So you're using a expanded clay pellets instead of soil. The water is distributing liquid nutrients uh, to the plant's roots directly. So you're gonna grow your plants healthier, faster. Danielle was raised in Austin, Texas and got her master's degree in Italy. And that's where I fell in love with furniture design. My future project is to create standalone lighting systems that are off the grid. So what that means is I'm gonna harness uh, different means of electricity. When you turn the lamp and you turn the sand over, now these don't have sand in them right now. Um, these are just the, the casings. Um, the and sand will, will filter through. It'll turn a mechanism that's inside actually generating the electricity, which it'll use to illuminate the fixture. Uh, also another method is piezoelectric, which it's using um, vibration. So as the, the sand is passing, it's creating vibrations on these little thin films, and it's gathering all that um, collective energy to um, redistribute that to create light energy. As soon as it runs through, it's recycling down to the base and then you turn it again. And so you're actually using a little bit of human power as well. Danielle has also been working on another intriguing concept. Biofabrication, growing uh, furniture and lighting. Growing <laughs> furniture and lighting. Exactly. She starts with mushroom mycelium and agricultural byproducts gathered by a local company called Ecovative. She uses them to create her mushroom lighting fixtures and mush bloom planters. The mushroom mycelium is the root structure of mushrooms. It's this tight network of, uh, of roots that um, bind together and it will grab everything. It's very strong and it grows rapidly. So it's almost like nature's glue. I'm using mushroom mycelium mixed with agricultural byproducts, so corn stalks, seed husks, hemp, and um, mixing this all together. It's packed into custom molds. This mold is actually 3D printed. Um, so I got to create something that's very original, um, very unique, and it'll grow over the course of four to seven days, depending on the size of it. All the white that you see, that's been grown. That's the mushroom mycelium. That's filling the space and binding together the ag waste. So you're creating a lampshade here? Yes, this is a lampshade. And then the final stage is to heat it. So it's placed into an oven at a high temperature and um, this basically renders the material inert. So it's not gonna, it's not gonna continue to grow in your living room. You know, once you finally get to the stage uh, where you see here, um, you know, you can actually touch the material. It's nice and soft. It's very, it's very light, lightweight, lightweight. Mm -hmm. and durable. It's completely uh, organic. It's safe. There's no spores used in it. Um, so instead of you know like any kind of glues that that um, that have any kind of toxins, uh, we also use a natural milk paint. So it's natural from the whole way through. Danielle has a startling approach to where her designs will end up. At the end of uh, its life, you can chop it up and plant it in your backyard, compost, and it's going to fully biodegrade. So instead of it ending up in a landfill, like a lot of our plastics uh, that take you know, 50, 100, you know, 1,000 years to, to biodegrade, it's gonna biodegrade in a couple months and actually add nutrients back into the soil. Most artists want their work to last for centuries. Why would you create something that's biodegradable? <laughs> you want to leave a legacy but uh, this is something that can be built upon, you know. So once you, you make one lamp um, and you use it for a period of time, you can make another one. And it's something that can exponentially grow and change just like nature does. But it's not gonna leave a legacy of waste and actually harm the environment and harm our future. It's a whole different way of really imagining how we create things and what they're created from. I'm Donna Hanover for Arts in the City.
You don't have to be a tourist to enjoy the wide array of fun and fascinating tours available in New York City. We've sent Barry Mitchell foraging for edible plants in Central Park, in search of the ghosts and haunted houses of Lower Manhattan, and even on a gourmet chocolate tour of Soho. But today, he's all about that basil. So it's early Sunday morning. I'm supposed to cover a four-hour pizza tour. Me, lactose intolerant, gluten-free, and tomato sauce gives me the worst acid indigestion. I have no idea. It's too depressing. I say something upbeat. Hey, who likes pizza? I'm Scott Wiener, and I run tours of famous pizzerias in New York City. I've been doing that since 2008. These ovens are made out of masonry. They're, they're made out of some material, brick, stone, clay. You know, I was just like really obsessed with pizza. For my birthday, eight years ago, I piled all my friends into a bus that we rented for the day, and we had them drive us around to all these famous pizzerias, and it was like, whoa, that is so much fun. Let's do this every week. Where are we going today? Today we're gonna do, we're at Lombardi's Pizzeria right now. Pineapple on pizza. Should it be a misdemeanor or a felony? It's a felony. Yeah. Okay. Today they get away with anything. In Lombardi's, we stick to traditional topping. So, John Brescio, is it true that Lombardi's is the first pizza place ever in America? That's the truth. It's in history books. This is a 110-year-old oven. This oven is made over 110 years ago. Cold burning oven. I, I burn at um, between eight and 900 degrees. Bring it right on to here. Beautiful. Bubba John cheese. Fresh basil? Fresh basil. That's a Barry pie. I wish I were the guy that created these little plastic tables. Yeah. That's where the money is. Yeah. That's what keeps it from sticking to the box. Correct. And also, peace. This has a little book that um, we put together so you can write down in the book each pizzeria we visit. It's a way to analyze your pizza. The sauce to cheese ratio was, uh, was pretty intense. This is a pizza that's a direct connection with Naples, Italy. In Naples, there's no such thing as pizza sauce. The sauce is really just crushed up tomato. 99 wedges of cheese on the wall, 99 wedges of cheese. Take one down, pass it around, 98 wedges of cheese on the wall. Okay, the next stop, Trendy Williamsburg and Patrizia's. What kind of pizza do they make? Keep on going, we can make it. There will be holes in this dough in the next minute. No, no, Daz, don't worry. Estelle's gonna rock the party. Oh, but the fingertip going through the dough. Estelle, Estelle, you're busted. <laughs> Wood-burning ovens tend to be hotter and tend to bake pizzas faster than coal-burning ovens. See how the fire is all off a little bit to the left side? Hot air rises, and since it rises along the curvature of this oven, it means that it's gonna undergo this circular convection cycle, and that's what bakes the pizza quickly. Here's a young lady that came dressed for the occasion. Where'd you get the shirt? Kids section of Bloomingdale's. You've done pizza tours in other cities. Tell yes. me about it. Well, I did a pizza tour in Chicago about a month ago. Can't compete, though, in New York. Can't How so? Compete. The deep dish, more of a hype. San Francisco? I don't know about that. They're all skinny there. What do they know about pizza? <laughs> yeah, they probably put pineapple on it. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want no pineapple on my pizza, just cheese and sauce. All right. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of pizza. I'm taking this bus to Chinatown for Lo Mein. Who's with me? <laughs> All right, release him. All right. Dear Diary, we left Williamsburg close to an hour ago, and we finally arrived here in Bensonhurst at the famous J&V Pizza. What kind of pizza are you eating? I'm eating a grandma slice. You guys have this oven, okay? This is a fish oven from 1950. It's a rotary deck oven. So the four panels in the inside are all stainless steel panels. And even when the oven's closed, you know which panel is up by the front because of this little dial. It's a natural gas-fueled oven. So on the bottom is the heat source and all that hot air rises. So this is the maneuver. It's real quick and graceful. It's amazing. When you're touring with Scott's Pizza, lots of calories you'll eat. Tours by bus.
dinosaur with your pizza. Like this song, it's full of cheese. <laughs> For more information, scottspizzatours.com. All right, we just plugged your business. Do I get a pizza of the action? Uh, I don't know if we can work that out, but uh, I do hope you have a sliced day. Uh, Come on, this was worse! That's our show for today. For more information on any of our stories or to watch them at any time, be sure to visit our website at the link below. I'm Donna Hanover, and thanks for watching Arts in the City.